Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I see everyone is on this side of the courtyard. There's no particular reason for that. This line, um, you are allowed to cross it if you'd like. Um, so I'd just like to say a few words before, uh, before we get started with the main event. Um, oh, I was kidding, you don't, ha you don't have to move over. Uh, so I'm Scott Walston, I'm uh, president of the Technology Policy Institute, and uh, welcome to Aspen and the 10th annual TPI Aspen Forum. We're thrilled that so many people find the forum to be valuable and that so many of you come back each year. What? <laughs> if you can. Well, more for Phil, not for me. The star for this evening, of course, is Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser. And I know you want to hear from him more than from me, but give me just a minute before I turn it over uh, to him. So first of all, and this is important, uh, if you have not been to Aspen before, um, wherever you're staying, there is a humidifier in your room and you should use it when you sleep or else you won't be able to sleep well and you'll get a headache. I promise you it'll make a difference. I learned that the hard way. Um, now, I also want to introduce the fantastic TPI staff uh, we have because, not just because they're amazing, but also to point out who everyone is so that if you have questions or problems, you can find uh, one of us um, and we can hopefully help you out. So first is uh, Jane Creel, right over there, who everybody uh, knows or should know. Uh, she's responsible for pretty much everything here. If it works, it's because of her. If it doesn't, it's because I, I got in the way. Um, and by the way, this is Jane's 20th Aspen. Uh, she did TPI and PFF before then. Um, Ashley Benjamin, who is over there, has helped many, many of you get here uh, and has collected and assembled just about everything we need um, for the conference to keep it running. Uh, Lindsay Poss, who is over there, uh, half research assistant, half communications expert, which is great for us because two half-time jobs is always more than a full-time job. <laughs> Uh, Nathaniel Lovin, who is over there, um, was our Google Policy Fellow last summer and came back to us as a research assistant this year, um, having graduated from Carleton College, and he's our uh, big data machine learning expert. Joe Fenner is next to him. He's this year's summer fellow, and he jumped right in and made himself indispensable in just a few weeks, which means, of course, that we're not letting him go back to Stanford. Sorry, we should have told you, but uh, David Fish, uh, back there, uh, joined us uh, joined us recently as our new communications guru, and he's been leading the charge to make sure that our work and conferences have the impact they deserve. Tom Leonard, a senior fellow, and you all know, uh, was president uh, TPI president before me. Uh, he um, recently went to half time and doubled his output. So we're, we're um, hoping that this year he'll go to quarter time and double it again. Uh, Sarah O, oh, our uh, resident genius JD PhD, keeps pumping out great research and innovative projects like our own TPI cryptocurrency, the TPIX, innovative databases, and so on. And a new addition uh, to TPI, a senior fellow Bob Hahn, who's over here, who's working on our evidence-based policy initiative. Bob recently left Oxford University and was also the founder of the AEI Brookings Joint Center for Regulatory Studies. Um, where he hired me, and so now I get to get back at him. Um, and so search them out and learn more about what this project is going to be. So we have a great program here at Aspen for you this year. Um, we hope that at times you'll be nodding in agreement, but also at times shaking your head in disagreement, taken aback, challenged by new ideas, and ultimately come away invigorated to engage in the policy issues we all think are so important. But we also want you to have fun, and we've done a lot to try to make that possible. First, um, in the email that you got, we have this um, in-browser app. We're calling it an app, but it lives in the browser. Um, you all received an email to sign up for it. It's built on blockchain uh, and has information about keynote speakers, panel discussions, links to our research, links to our podcast, um, and collectible commemorative coins. Uh, if, you, if you haven't signed up for it, just go to tpiaspen.org and do that. And also, on that main page, tpiaspen.org, does all the information about the app and what's interesting and unique about it. It's, if you want to learn something about blockchain, it's kind of interesting. It's a fun way to learn about it. Now, second, uh, we have a little scavenger hunt. Uh, you'll find clues listed on that same website, but we also have a handout that lists them all. I think it's at the registration table. 
Um, when you solve a clue, you scan a QR code, either with an in-app scanner or your camera or a dedicated QR reader. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just find one of us later and we'll help you out. Um, when you scan the code, a coin will appear in your collection. Uh, and just as a heads up, the pictures on the coins are not connected to the clue, except possibly by accident. Uh, and thanks to some generous donations, the first few to collect all 10 clues will win a prize. We have an Amazon Echo Dot, a Google Nest Hub, Disney theme park tickets, Apple AirPods, and a large collection of Universal Studio movies. Thanks very much to the companies that donated them. We know that some of you can't accept prizes, um, so you can still play the game, just don't take anything. Uh, and um, remember that because the app is built on blockchain and the blockchain is immutable, we will know the order in which people find things um, and you can't change it. But just in case something goes wrong, send us an email when you finish up. Um, now, third, we created an ERC-20 Ethereum-based crypto coin uh, in honor of the 10th conference called the TPIX. And of course, when I say we, I mean Sarah, who's the only one who understands it. This is her baby. The token you may have received in the mail is actually kind of a, a wallet um, that has a public and private key to your crypto coin. We have detailed instructions on how to transfer it to a more secure wallet, or we can just help you with that ourselves. Um, and if you didn't get a coin or you didn't bring it, come get another one because fourth, tomorrow night after the breakout sessions, we are hosting what at one point in history would have been a common but illegal activity. And um, even though this is Colorado, it's not what you're thinking. Um, and it'll take place at the bar called Hooch, which is just a two-minute walk down the street, and you will need a red TPIX token to get in, and we'll have them around for you. Now, on to the substance of tonight. And hopefully Phil is here. Um, okay, good. So we are honored to have the 39th Attorney General of the State of Colorado, Phil Weiser, opening the TPI Forum this year. Phil and his work have been a cornerstone of the tech and communications policy landscape for a long time. So most everyone here knows the contours of Phil's career. He founded Silicon Flatiron Center for Law, Technology, and Entrepreneurship. He was the Hatfield Professor of Law and the Dean of the, uh, of the University of Colorado, Colorado Law School. He's written scholarly books and hundreds of articles. Now, there are plenty of there are theories on what motivates people to uh, run for office and, and engage in public service. And the, the, the most basic one is that we want policymakers to act in the public interest. And lots of theories have developed beyond that, especially for regulation that are more sophisticated and so on. But you know, we all want to believe that policy should be in the public interest, setting aside the question of we don't know how to define the public interest. Um, but Phil is unique in that he strives to make that ideal happen. That's clear from his research, which exudes an innate thoughtfulness and desire to see the best possible outcomes. And, um, and shows that he views policy as a tool to getting things right. We see it in his activities from founding the Silicon Flatirons to working in the US Department of Justice and the National Economic Council under President Obama. The positive influence he's had on so many people is obvious from the moving tributes to him at uh, Philippalooza when he stepped down from Silicon Flatirons when he became Attorney General. And with all of that, his election was a reminder that good, truthful, thoughtful, and hardworking people can still be elected to important offices. And that's something to celebrate. Um, and so with that, thank you, be Phil. Thank you so much, Scott. I have to indulge in what's often called a Yiddish prerogative of let me take a few words before I speak. Crowds get that at different rates, usually. The advice I often give people about introductions is less facts, more flavor. And Scott, that was the most flavorful introduction I've ever received. Really appreciate it. And I want to start on that flavor because we're at this time when people are so cynical about politics. In one sense, to read between the lines of his introduction, public choice theory has been completely successful. People refuse to ever believe that anyone in public life is doing this because they want to make a difference. And so when I ran, I faced this very interesting challenge. How would I engage in what is an enterprise that quickly gets debased? And my commitment was I was going to try to educate, if not elevate. And I think I was able to educating, and I definitely tried to elevate. 
there's so much about politics that is often rooted in insults, in debasing the discourse. And I was committed that if nothing else, I could come through a campaign and still be myself. Or as I put it to Blair Levin earlier, my life as a politician is an experiment in being myself while also now being the Attorney General. And you all can judge the results over time, but my view is whatever slice of my world work we do together, you're gonna to be like, that's the Phil I know. Because that's how we overcome the level of cynicism that we have right now. We have to recognize the damage that's happening to our core institutions. The Pew Research Study did this survey, asking people if they trusted government to operate in the public interest. They didn't use those words, but those are what they were at getting at. And if you look at 18 to 29 year olds, it's not close. More of them distrusted government. They distrusted other people. They distrust the free market system. And most scarily, many of them, thankfully not a majority, distrust democracy itself, saying they would be OK living under authoritarian rule. That's the profound challenge we're now facing. Michael Lewis just did a podcast called Against the Rules. Anyone here listen to that podcast? James Assey. James, it's extraordinary, right? Really well done. And it's all about the role of referees in our society. Do people trust that their institutions that help to resolve disputes, that help make sure financial crises don't happen, that student lenders don't misbehave? And what comes through is lots and lots of cynicism. And part of the challenge we're facing is how do we overcome that cynicism and make our institutions work as they're intended to work. When you look at the stories in the news, you see a lot of examples of people who feel they've been treated unfairly, whether it's data that's not being guarded by Equifax to stories of our criminal justice system, we've got to do better. And the message I want to share with you is two bright lights that I see as incredibly powerful and often get looked over because so much of the policy discourse is Washington-centric. So first, I want to talk about the states as laboratories of democracy, as Louis Brandeis once put it. And secondly, I want to talk about collaborative problem solving as so wonderfully captured by my experience here in Colorado. First, about the states as laboratory democracy. The last time I was here in Aspen was for the Aspen Ideas Festival. I'd never been before. I can now recommend it to all of you. I got to see a great panel with David Brooks talking about his research on weavers, Brett Stevens talking about mediating institutions and civil society, and then I got to be on a panel with a couple other state AGs talking about the role of state attorneys general. And what came through that discussion is this theme. We are laboratories of democracy. We are on the front lines of solving important issues. Take, for example, the opioid epidemic. Working together, state AGs, and across party lines, we are working on addressing what is a national crisis. And there are many routes to this crisis, but one of which is our certain companies, most notably Purdue Pharma, made a whole bunch of money, knowingly push drugs that they knew were highly addictive while lying about it. There will be, like in tobacco at some point, likely a settlement, maybe litigated judgment, and that's where the challenge starts for us on the front lines. How do we take that money and address this crisis, making sure that we support drug treatment and recovery? Because as I look across my state, I see how some parts of our state are so hard hit. In Alamosa, Colorado, for example, the county jail has a set of inmates of whom 90% are opioid addicts. And the sheriff there says, I can't help them. They get in there and they're going through withdrawal. And when they leave, they're uniquely vulnerable to overdose. We are losing people, and more people died last year of drug overdoses, mostly opioids, than died in the Vietnam War and the Iraq War combined. That's the sort of challenge we're facing. And as I do the work I'm doing, including with my colleagues from other states, I'm inspired about the ability to actually make a difference. In the tech policy area, that's true too. A number of states are moving ahead to look at privacy and data security. We passed a law a year ago here in Colorado to provide oversight and guidance 
that is not forthcoming from a federal government that unfortunately is not able to operate. And so one message to all of you is look to work with states on a range of issues, whether it's directly in the tech space or maybe in other areas like criminal justice improvement or the opioid epidemic. Let me talk a little bit more about Colorado in particular. Before I ran to be Attorney General, I wrote an article called Entrepreneurial Administration. I would recommend it to all of you and thereby double my readership. <laughs> the idea here is that governmental entities and even private sector entities can work to solve problems through innovative problem solving. And in one sense, government isn't about Democrats versus Republicans. It's about the status quo versus innovation. And a lot of people who are in government are going to keep doing what they've always done. And my commitment and the team that I'm working on building is one where innovation is a core value. And we will ask, how might we better accomplish what we're trying to do? And I can tell you that in no area more than water management is that value clear. Some of you I know have seen the Roaring Fork River, river close by. Others may have seen the Colorado River, which plays an extraordinarily important role to us here in Colorado. And in the water community, and this week I go to the Colorado Water Congress in Steamboat Springs, another place I'd recommend to all of you to visit. Now that I'm a statewide political figure, I gotta give the you know, boosting that comes with that. In Steamboat, we're gonna talk about water, and one of the great things is climate change is not a debate, because we know it's happening in Colorado. We have less natural snowpack than we did 10, 20 years ago. Now this year, we had an exceptional year, but we know the work we've gotta do. There's less water because we have less natural snowpack, and there are more people. You can't deficit finance water, which means what we're doing is bringing innovation and collaboration to solve problems. Like one example, Aurora is getting new water by going to this abandoned mine where the water was going to run right close to it. It's a real threat of getting contaminated. No one wanted to use it. So they said, why don't we divert the water before the mine so it doesn't get uh, badly sort of polluted, and we also can then get a source of water. That's the sort of innovation we've got to keep working on. And in the water community, that's front and center. In the San Luis Valley, where Alamosa County is, they've got to manage how do they reduce water use because the underground aquifers have been depleted. And from a bottom-up solutions, they're working together on ways to move crops. Using alfalfas takes up a lot of water, but hemp, not so much. That's the sort of spirit of collaborative problem solving we need. That's the sort of spirit of innovation. Now, we're doing that here in Colorado. One of the challenges, we're not seeing that as much on the federal level. So what all of us can do is when we do our work to bring our best authentic selves, to try not to get too disillusioned. Because if we don't believe that we can improve public policy, we're not going to. And we are living in this challenging moment when our very institutions are being tested. And I want to thank all of you for coming together with a commitment to evidence-based policymaking, to real dialogue and real problem solving, because we need that so desperately. Thank you all for your work, and I'd welcome any questions. And as someone who spent a bunch of time as a professor, I'm not afraid to call on people, particularly former students like Kelton. All right, Baron, what do you got? This is a friendly question. Uh, for people who know Baron, that's a high compliment. Well, first of all, congratulations. I, I can only say I wish there were more people like you elected to uh, all the attorneys general offices in the US and public office more generally. I'd like to hear what you have in mind as to restoring the damage that's been done to particularly legal institutions, to the way that the Department of Justice has been politicized, and in particular, what you think we could learn from the way that President Ford and his attorney general, um, Edward Levy, the first Jewish attorney general, the, it was called the model uh, attorney general in the United States, someone who really worked for two years to restore the honor and integrity of the Department of Justice. What, what lessons would you draw from that experience or from your own experience? How would you rebuild the, the respect for the rule of law that has been so badly attacked in the last two and a half years? First off, we all need to be singing off this sheet of music the consequences of undermining core institutions and the rule of law pose a mortal threat to our nation. Dale Hatfield, who's here and deserves all the celebration everyone here can give him. Let's give a hand for Dale Hatfield. <laughs> Dale almost thought I wasn't going to embarrass him. 
Dale and I, and, and I do this because of Dale, have done a lot of teaching with developing nations around the world. And so has Brian Tremont, who's next to, to Dale. And the question often comes, what do you do when you have corruption of the institutions? It's a haunting question because it's not an easy one to answer. When you have the rule of law and people trust it, you can take it for granted. But in countries around the world that don't have it, where they're not talking about how many Gs in certain countries, they're talking about how do we know that spectrum licenses will be respected as a property right as opposed to just being taken arbitrarily because the, the government doesn't like you. Let me talk about the rule of law and a very scary moment that all of us were probably not terrified about enough. I, with other state AGs, filed a lawsuit to protect the constitutional commitment to an actual enumeration of the population. Whether or not you like the Constitution, the standard's clear. Everybody is to be counted in the census, which means the goal of the census is to count everybody. And if Steve Bannon had a plan specifically to undercount people, that should not be allowed because it is antithetical to the rule of law. Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, according to the district court judge, plainly lied about why he was doing what he was doing. And ultimately, the Supreme Court said, yes, it was a contrived purpose. And there really was no justification from departing from historic practice, which wasn't to ask people about their citizenship. For about a week or so there, we were facing what you might call an Andrew Jackson moment. For those who forget Andrew Jackson, one of his contributions to American jurisprudence was the following idea that came after the Trail of Tears decision. John Marshall ruled the Trail of Tears was unconstitutional. Andrew Jackson said, Chief Justice Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. We didn't know if we were going to see the President of the United States and maybe the Attorney General say the Supreme Court has made their decision, we're going to do something else. If that had happened, we would have been in a full-fledged constitutional crisis. Thankfully, that didn't happen. But for a week or so, we were seeing the precipice in front of us. We we're also now seeing another case involving the Affordable Care Act. And this is, again, the Justice Department taking a position that is outlandish. The position is, if you declare one provision of the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional, you should invalidate the entire law. So the one provision is about the individual mandate. But the law has lots of other stuff in it much of which has nothing to do with the individual mandate, Medicaid expansion. Kids can be on their parents' plans until 26. Nonetheless, the DOJ is taking this position that the whole law is unconstitutional. Congress passed this law. Congress failed to overturn it. The Supreme Court upheld this law. I believe it will be upheld again, but the threat to this law is not only about the threat to people's health care, which is profound. In Colorado, we have 700,000 people with protection from pre-existing conditions. 400,000 people who got Medicaid expansion. But it's not only about that. It's about the rule of law. And the Department of Justice needs to be the guardian of the rule of law. And it's not a good thing when the career lawyers, for example, on the Census case and on the Affordable Care Act case, recuse themselves or quit because they say, I can't in good conscience do something that is antithetical to the rule of law. So we are going to need to rebuild the fabric of the Justice Department. And that can only happen if the American people are committed to saying, we're not going to allow us to depart from the rule of law. Your reference to Ed Levy is a great one. He passed away, was it recently, was it? And so did Justice John Paul Stevens. The way Stevens was appointed is Ed Levy, at the insistence of President Ford, looked for the most trustworthy, evidence-based policy, making independent-minded antitrust lawyer he could find. John Paul Stevens. John Paul Stevens was an incredible justice. And the thing that Ford said, Ford, by the way, lived a lot up in Vail, just up the road. Ford said, if I'm only judged my entire presidency by picking Stevens to the Supreme Court, I'm good with that. And so am I. That, that's a legacy. And right now, we're going to need another Ed Levy as our next head of the Department of Justice. And we're going to need more John Paul Stevens on the Supreme Court. And to give a sense of John Paul Stevens, a case very few people talk about called Duke Power was a case involving whether or not the Price-Anderson Act was constitutional. And it was a law involving nuclear power plants. 
It was struck down in the lower courts, and all the nuclear power companies' stocks went in the toilet. The Supreme Court agreed to hear the case because the Justice Department asked. It was eight to one, Stevens dissenting. Stevens said the court didn't actually have um, jurisdiction to hear the case because there's no actual controversy. The rest of the court said, we got to make clear this law is constitutional, but he was so principled that he would feel free to say what he believed. And that's, again, a spirit that he represented, commitment to law, commitment to discourse. We got to get back to that. Drew. So Drew Clark, uh, Broadband Breakfast. I just want to build a little bit on one of the points you're making and ask and reference uh, Jim and Deborah Fallow's book, Our Towns. I'm not oh, sure yeah. if you've heard of it. I have. Uh, what, what I, I mean, it's not just about broadband or even exclusively, but it really is about the way uh, communities can get things done in a way that can't happen on the national level because of the politicization of our discourse. I'm just wondering if you could address are states at risk of teetering into that national toxic politi politicization? Or are you seeing more of the sort that you see where, as Jim and Deb write in the book, you know, Burlington, Vermont, and Columbia, South Carolina are completely different cities, but whether, whether or not they, they can get things done because they, they don't have that partisanness attached at the local level. So I'm just wondering if you could speak about that on the state level what bad signs and what positive signs do you see there? I've not read the book yet. It's one of many books in my piles of books to read. But I have heard Jim Fowles on a podcast. And so I have some awareness. And I will tell you, I went into this as an experiment. I didn't know what to expect. A couple weeks ago, I did a town hall in Delta, Colorado, and another one in Grand Junction, Colorado, not liberal bastions. And I did it with. Republican state representatives. And it was focused, focused on what problems we can work on to solve together, like the opioid epidemic, like improving criminal justice, like water. And what is powerful at the state and local level is you can work on those sorts of issues and it doesn't become the same toxic partisan mess that can so quickly happen in Washington. I, I worry a little bit about what you say because there are two futures for the United States of America. In one future, we take the experience that I'm having here in Colorado and we get back to that on the national level. The other experience is the toxicity on the national level pervades state and local governance and gets in the way with collaborative problem solving. So I'm going to bet on our ability to keep this in Colorado and I'm going to work hard to see that get followed at the national level. But the honest truth is we don't know which direction it's going. I'm going to bet on the positive outcome. Absolutely. And so, for example, uh, Matt Soper, a state rep from Grand Junction, we work together on reforming our consumer protection laws and reforming cash bail here in Colorado. Those are not necessarily partisan issues. And as long as you can keep that spirit of goodwill and engagement, no one has a monopoly on good ideas. And getting back to the Supreme Court analogy, Ginsburg would say she loved the dynamic she had with Scalia, which is even if they didn't agree, the dialogue made her ideas better. Blair. First of all, congratulations on uh, the job you're doing. It's really great. Um, I'm, I want to ask a question about the legal framework that's kind of a follow-up to Drew's question on political culture. You mentioned Brandeis's uh, Laboratories of Democracy when he said that we were an agricultural nation moving toward a manufacturing nation. We've since moved to kind of a service economy, and now we're moving to an information economy. And since the the kind of the railroads of that information economy are the internet, and the internet is actually quite national, if not international. The question is, what is the trade-off between the laboratories of democracy with an interstate commerce clause, which essentially moves all the power to the federal government for the economy? And I mean, this is something we're going to be debating over the next 10 years, but do you have any initial thoughts on that? I do. I, I think it is very easy to say if it's a technology policy issue, therefore it's national or maybe international. And what I would say is, let's not make that move too quickly. And let me give you a couple examples. There's a lot of discussion about smart cities. How do you architect smart cities? And what we need is experiments. And we need data. A lot of people are nervous about facial recognition. They're worried about how it would be used and abused. 
the ability of state and local governments to be those laboratories to develop what model smart cities look like is an incredible strength that we have in this country. And if we said, oh, it's a technology policy issue, we're only going to think about it nationally, you're making a big mistake. And even if you think about issues like data security, there are a lot of businesses that do operate primarily in some states and that are not that sophisticated. And the, the value of having something closer to people is it's easier to have an engaged discussion. So the Federal Trade Commission can share data security practices across the whole nation, but they're not local and they don't have branch offices in every state. When I was writing about the Telecom Act circa 1998, I was writing about cooperative federalism in that context as a strength. I still believe it's a strength even on issues like data security or smart cities. And one of the fun things that's happened is people said, well, were you only believing in federalism as state AG because now that's where your ox is gored? I can say, no, go back 20 years, read what I wrote in law review articles. It's a straight line to what I'm saying now. Thanks, Blair. Um, so we've seen federalist laws and, you know, with pot or dope, whatever they call it, the kids call it these days, 420. Do you, do you think we could see the same with technology regulation? Because what I mean is you talk about the divisiveness, the divisiveness of this country. And, you know, Benjamin Franklin used to write these hotly wired op-eds under a pseudonym as a woman. And they'd be read by 1,000 or 2,000 people. Now any ding-dong can write something and have it read by millions. I mean, I think technology's role in the splitting, if you will, of America is clear. So my question is, do you think that states should be more obligated to mitigate this? Because I feel like technologies, especially social media and parts of it, are where the auto industry was in 1915. Everyone has a car. We're driving around, slamming into each other. There's no rules of the road. There's no street lights. There's no stoplights. At some point, we're going to figure it out. Do the states figure it out, or does the federal government figure it out? So a few different thoughts. Let me start with one element that sometimes gets overlooked, which is the role of norms. When I said all of us be our best authentic selves, there's no time that's more challenging than on Twitter. If you can stay elevated as opposed to going to the gutter, it will better serve your community and political culture. So one of the points that, to Drew's question, and it's really a painful one to think about, which is how does political culture operate? How does it get undermined? Social media can be a tool. It can also, for good or for not so good. And one of the interesting questions is can Coloradans' identity as people who are committed to collaborative problem solving help last because the norms here don't end up tolerating the hating and debasement that often happens. John Hickenlooper, our former governor, had a very famous campaign ad of him taking a shower because he was so repulsed by all the dirty campaigning. And the challenge for social media is can we have political leaders who elevate, and in my aspiration also educate, but refuse to dissent? Now, will there be other forms of governance beyond norms, and how, do that get, how does that get done? One question will be, will there be local discussions, forums to help do that? We're in very early days, as you know. I want to start by saying we've got a chance now with states developing norms, and it has to start with political leaders. Um, and one of the many challenges, back to Barron's point, is it's not helpful to have the President of the United States setting the worst possible example on Twitter. That's just not helpful to our discourse. It, it helps fuel people thinking that you can say whatever you want because you feel that way, as opposed to, how do I learn from you? And what Roy Romer, former governor of Colorado, said, which is so powerful and not necessarily what social media is about, is all truth is partial. Roy Romer's commitment was whoever he's talking to, whatever dialogue he's having, the question he's asking is, how do I learn from someone? And a big challenge for social media is how can that media become more of an environment for learning and for listening? I don't know the answer to that. Um, if people have ideas for me, I welcome it. If people have feedback for me on my social media, I welcome it. And one of the things which is nice about state, state AGs, and this goes across party lines, is we say to each other, 
if you see something on social media that's not elevating, that's not grounded in rigorous analysis, let us know, because the rule of law and the tools we have needs to be grounded in facts, needs to be grounded in evidence, needs to be grounded in rigorous analysis. That's the work that this community is doing at its best, and I do recognize the challenges we face to it, and thank you all for helping us take them on. Thanks so much, Phil. That was, that was great. Um, so uh, just enjoy yourselves for now, and we'll see you uh, bright and early tomorrow morning. What time, Jane? 7.30. 7.30 for breakfast downstairs. <laughs>